Good afternoon, good, good evening, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to facilitate this session, which is focused on training and capacity building for malaria. Over the next 50 minutes, I will take you two rounds of presentation and discussion, as well as feedback from the audience. As you know, all of the things have been said shows that it is possible to eliminate malaria from high body countries, especially African countries. The evidence has shown that countries such as Sri Lanka and uh, China have reduced malaria or completely eliminated malaria. That suggests that the two and protocols and the scientific wisdom to eliminate malaria is already available around the world. And probably what is lacking that ensures that Africa now accounts for about more than 90% of malaria is because of lack of uh, capacity to use these well-known technologies. That's where uh, training and capacity building rests. And I'm very happy today that a lot of registrants for this particular webinar are from universities in Africa. And I hope that uh, the results and um, results they get from this webinar will be very useful in repositioning themselves to be able to deal with the problem of malaria in their countries. To do justice to these presentations, to this session, I have two very distinguished presenters. One is Dr. Halima Wenesi, and the other is Dr. Corina Mucherad. The first speaker is Dr. Halima Wenesi, who I've known over the last few months as a result of our work on this particular project. She will be speaking for 10 minutes on the subject of taking malaria, sorry, retaking my resources and capacity building needs for malaria control and elimination in Africa. Dr. Halima uh, Wenesi is currently an independent global head consultant based in the United States. But she tells me she frequently comes to China, Kenya. And the last time I spoke to her, she was actually in Nairobi. She is a global head consultant and also the immediate past director of infectious diseases at NFHI 2360, where she served as a focal person that oversaw the program of the FSI on, on malaria control in, uh, in the region. So I would like to, first of all, invite Dr. Halima Wenesi to make a presentation over 10 minutes. Halima, over to you, please. Good afternoon, chairs, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, since yesterday, we have been um, reminded about the burden of malaria, so I will skip the statistics. Working Group 3 was tasked was with identifying human resources and capacity building needs for malaria going forward. So to identify key areas for targeted efforts, we combined a comprehensive literature review with direct feedback gathered from frontline malaria workers and leaders and scholars from Africa. We all agree that a strong human resource of, uh, for health platform in terms of adequate resources and numbers and also skill sets and competencies is the, backlog, is the backbone of a strong health system, not only for better health outcomes, but the achievement of global health outcomes and also um, national and global malaria goals, as well as sustainable development and universal health coverage. We worked on two questions. The first one was the question about human resource workforce, the situation in terms of numbers for the successful implementation of malaria control and elimination going forward. And the second question was, what are the essential gaps in training and skills and competencies for capacity building to ensure malaria elimination becomes a reality in Africa? In the next three slides, we highlight in a few, uh, a few key findings, uh, details of the same are in the full papers that you, that you will have access to. And an important point I want to highlight before I go to the next um, slide 
is that Africa is reportedly um, carrying 17% of the world's population and accounts for the highest burden of disease, standing at the moment at 23%, but it has only 3% of the global health workforce. And COVID-19, having decimated a large number of health workers in its wake, has amplified the problem and really makes addressing human resources for health issues an emergency that we have to deal with. Now, we found a number of human resource workforce issues. And the first one was that there is a chronic workforce shortage in the form in the name in, the, in most of the countries in Africa due to many issues, but mostly poor recruitment and replacement and deployment strategies and policies. There is also lack of career pathways, personal and professional growth. There's of course poor remuneration and lack of incentives, which of course leads to high state staff turnover, attrition and brain drain. And there's lack of proper planning and management of transfers and retirements. Also, another key issue that we found was that there is a lack of databases or registries on human resources for health, which results in poor estimation of the workforce and their competency skills, which in turn affects forecasting for future capacity needs and financial planning. With regard to training and capacity issues, we found out, we found out that high cost and time lags for advanced training in clinical sciences especially and research negatively impacts the pipeline for needed experts. There is also fragmented training approaches which uh, uh, runs through the countries, whether it's in our own institutions or also institutions in the North. And this is because um, there is an absence of a global malaria training strategy and curricula, which then does not serve malaria response needs at the country level. And we have heard this from yesterday that there's a lack of data, there's a lack of data sciences literacy across the board, which means then that it's very difficult for us to measure what we are doing. And one very important area um, and capacity issue was over-reliance on biomedical sciences while downplaying training in relevant social science skills and competencies. And these really are very necessary for malaria programs, management and leadership. And we've had this uh, from across many of the speakers. There is, um, there is this are also necessary for proper communication, advocacy, social and resource mobilization there are issues related to gender, which we heard um, from one of the speakers yesterday, um, and also human rights integrations into interventions that are being carried out for malaria. There are issues related to analytical problem solving skills at the, at the levels, especially of national malaria control programs. And of course, the BAIN, which is uh, we have been talking about community engagement, community engagement. What we are seeing in this situation is that there is a focus on the parasite and the mosquito, but there is, there is lack of focus on the, on the human being who is the third, the, the third arm of um, the, the malaria transmission cycle. Other workforce uh, challenges and capacity related challenges that we found were related to weak multi-sectorial joint and joint training programming and workforce management, especially between health and non-health sectors. We all know that malaria is impacted by many other things, especially uh, in areas of agriculture, in education, in housing, in water um, hygiene and sanitation areas. And, and these are areas that need to work together multi-sectorally so that we can holistically address the issue of malaria. Also, we have been talking about community engagement, and I see this as an inspirational community engagement agenda, but it has not really been taken serious, seriously because when we talk about community health workers, they are not properly trained, they are not certified, and their remuneration for the community health workers and other frontline workers is also not taken seriously. Another issue is related to um, gender issues. A global health workforce that is 70% female, mostly uneducated, minimally trained, overworked and underpaid. And this is, does not just end there. We have a very huge shortage of women in science in general and very few in malaria leadership and even fewer in global health leadership.
what can we do about these things that I have highlighted? First of all, there are areas um, in workforce shortage. Uh, the area of workforce, workforce shortage can be addressed through employment of very innovative ways to train and utilize millions of unemployed youth in Africa and young adults. We know that the world currently has about 64 million unemployed youth, and this can be used in many of the interventions that we have for malaria. We also need to strengthen um, the human resources for health um, information systems, which will create a database which allows us to know what numbers of health workers we have, their skill sets, and this allows for better man management and planning. The other area that uh, I think we, there is an opportunity for change is in health workforce investment. And this is where we want to empower health workers through readiness training, incentivizing, um, incentivization and appropriate remuneration at all levels, including for community health workers. And most importantly too, we want to standardize training uh, globally by training, by being a training strategy and curriculum that can be used by different institutions at, for different levels and cadres, but which can then be um, context specified for mo most of the countries and, and areas where malaria eradication, malaria elimination needs to happen. And lastly, we want to also look at where the leadership should be. We heard yesterday that the leadership focus must shift from from the north and come to the south where the, the malaria problem is. And this will begin to be a, a reality when we have true partnerships between northern and southern um, institutions that train for the, the malaria workforce. But these changes require political financial commitment from endemic countries and goodwill and finances from the global development partners to materialize. And in conclusion, I think we want to encourage a holistic approach to integration of different control programs to maximize effect and, and optimize resource, resources. So we don't want to, to perpetuate the usual way of training um, in, 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 um, in, a, in areas where we, we, we focus vertically on training for malaria, for TB and other infectious diseases. We want to ensure that vector-borne diseases and other infectious diseases are all, uh, the training takes place in an integrated manner. And then we want to focus on building the capaci capacities of ordinary men and women to empower them to make malaria their own problem because right now malaria is the problem of scientists. Hey, Mike. Alma, you have one minute more. Yes. One minute. And yes, lastly, Yes. Lastly, we must collectively make deliberate decisions to do things differently and urgently address the identified issues, most of which are immediately actionable. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Halima, for that very good overview of the assessment of uh, human resources in high academic country and your offerings of recommendations on the way forward. Very good presentation. So. Uh, I will, questions will wait, just keep your questions and then send them to the chat room and then we take them at the end, at the second presentation, at the end of the second presentation and then the discussion. The next paper will be presented by Dr. Corina Mocherad and she will speak on the next subject which is reframing malaria for equity and universal health coverage, a subject matter that is very dear to my heart and that is critical for malaria country in Africa. Dr. Corina Mochirat is an associate professor of health policy at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and is also an associate professor, associate center director at the UCLA Center for Human Policy Research in the United States of America. Corina, it's over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present our working group's work specifically around reframing malaria for equity and universal health coverage. 
I'm presenting on behalf of Working Group 2 of the Rethinking Malaria Initiative. Our focus was on integrated service delivery for malaria. We had a subset of issues specifically focused on R&D and the private sector. I'm presenting today on behalf of the Working Group and specifically myself and my co-chair, uh, Professor Evelyn Ansah. If you attended yesterday's webinar, you heard her speak about data for decision-making in malaria. Um, she's a professor of clinical epidemiology and the director of the Center for Malaria Research at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Accra, Ghana. Our working group had um, a sort of dual mandate um, within the umbrella of looking at how we can more effectively and equitably deliver services universally and in an integrated manner. And within that, we had these sort of two foci. One was to identify opportunities for maximizing impact with existing tools and best practices through strengthened implementation. And the second was to highlight areas where new technology and new operational innovation could catalyze progress toward malaria elimination and eventually eradication, and specifically whether there were lessons we could learn here from COVID-19 and beyond. The methods that we undertook within the working group, we conducted a literature review. Uh, we also conducted key informant interviews with over 35 stakeholders involved in malaria control efforts um, from around the world, especially those who are really on the front lines of the malaria response. We also got feedback from um, an advisory committee and we had weekly author meetings to discuss the results as they were developing. There were six key messages that emerged from our working group's efforts. And one of those is the one that I'll be speaking with you about today, reframing malaria as an equity issue. There are going to be four key points on this that I'll touch on in this presentation. The first is to prioritize research on inequities. We very well know that malaria burden is not equally borne by all members of society, but we're really lacking rich research on who specifically is bearing most of that burden. And particularly important and particularly missing from this conversation has been the intersectionality of risk. So for example, we know that vulnerability does not exist along just one axis, and that in particular, we might wanna focus on how different sources of vulnerability intersect. For instance, if we know that rural populations who live far from health facilities may face geographic barriers in accessing care, we also might think about how that geographic vulnerability overlays with socioeconomic vulnerability. So are all populations in rural areas at equal risk or are there ways in which wealth and area of residence intersect? Without understanding this intersectionality and how these determinants are, are playing out, without really understanding how that risk is being borne, we can't design interventions, strategies, and policies that are going to be maximally effective. And this is particularly important when we think about building a malaria response that's truly multi-sectoral. So if you think about bringing in other ministries and other stakeholders, this is particularly when this intersectionality of risk and vulnerability will be important to understand. Um, related to this is improving our understanding of the social determinants of malaria. We were interested in knowing the sort of state of the science on this. And so we did a quick bibliometric analysis. We looked in PubMed for what articles have been published looking at inequities or social determinants um, in the field of malaria. And we compared that to the relevant research on these topics in HIV and tuberculosis. Um, this shows you the publications over time in PubMed starting in 1987 until 2020 on the x-axis and the number of articles on the y-axis. Um, malaria is in orange here. It's the really small bar at the bottom. And you can see, you know, over this period, there have been over a thousand um, HIV related articles on social determinants and only 155 in the field of malaria. This is not a fully comprehensive search. And I'm sure we miss things in this analysis, but even in this sort of quick and dirty look, it really appears as though malaria is lagging um, some of its infectious disease peers in terms of understanding social determinants and really having a rich nuanced research agenda Agenda around inequities. So how do we address this? Um, echoing the presentation right before mine, a big one is thinking about how we can bring social scientists into malaria research. And um, in our discussions, there was um, much dialogue about malaria needing to be a sort of big tent discipline. So moving beyond just biomedical or just sort of public health approaches and thinking about how we can bring in other expertise, and in this case, social science expertise. 
to facilitate that, a few changes might be needed. So one is funders should really be supporting this research. We should think about financing for malaria research as encompassing social science explorations about equity, about inequity, about intersector, uh, inter intersectional vulnerability. Also scientific conferences should see this type of work as a core area. This should be a, a pillar of where the science is headed. It should be you know, accepted and explored by scientists across the malaria space. Similarly, journals should encourage submissions on these topics, which likewise means that editors uh, should find reviewers qualified to assess these papers. If this is sort of moving outside the traditional malaria field, you know, how can we sort of bring more people in as scientists, as authors, as reviewers um, to help generate and disseminate this information? Third, um, we discussed the importance of being clear about what equity means. So I've said that this is about reframing malaria as an equity issue, but equity of what? Are we talking about equity of access? Are we talking about equity of outcomes? And, and even within those, which, you know, is it access to new technologies? Is it access to um, diagnostics or treatment and even outcomes? Are we talking about incidents? Are we talking about mortality? So really being specific in, in what we're trying to seek equity in. And through that process, being really cognizant of the trade-offs that might occur at subnational, national, or regional levels. So seeking equity for one group may um, have sort of spillover effects onto other groups and really being conscientious of that. Um, and also about potential efficiency losses. So it's possible that prioritizing by prioritizing equity, we have losses elsewhere. And so thinking that through, being clear, being deliberate about that as part of the process of reframing with an equity lens. And we feel this is important because once we have explicit conversations about what equity means, then we can design strategies to try to remediate it. So if we're very interested in financial inequities in particular, we might look towards health financing mechanism, but that would be a very different conversation than if we're interested in geographic inequities, which we might think about um, health infrastructure or addressing marginal, the needs of marginalized and vulnerable populations. You might think about community-based care delivery. Um, so, and it may be that, especially thinking about the intersection sectionality argument that more than one of these tools needs to be deployed at once, but having this conversation helps us think about targeting and prioritizing where we want to focus. And the last point within this um, thought about equity is you know, there's many very important social movements afoot, and this has come up over the last two days of the webinar. There's a strong women's movement, a youth movement, a climate change movement, and, and these all should be can be and should be seen as potential partners in the malaria response. And we argue that by reframing malaria as an equity issue, that really clarifies ways to collaborate with these groups in meaningful and mutually beneficial and mutually reinforcing ways. So taking an equity and social justice lens to malaria opens up opportunities for engaging different groups, um, particularly in civil society and social movements that we think would be really exciting. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Corinna, for that great presentation and for keeping the time. Um, I think that the issue of equity is so generic and so important for malaria control. As you identify areas for possible future research and also the deficit of research around the issue of related to equity malaria control in Africa in the African continent. So I believe that uh, our colleagues in the universities are listening and therefore they will be more able to tailor some of the research questions they would like to engage with to ensure that malaria really covers all elements of equity that we deal with in Africa as a way to solve the problem once and for all. Now, uh, I will still uh, urge you to keep your questions. The next two speakers will be discussants of the two papers. Doctor, uh, we have two papers to be discussed. Uh, the first paper will be discussed by Dr. Tuami Kourida, who is uh, most recently, Dr. Kora, most recently, and uh, is a medical professor and director of the Medical Research Council in the Gambia. And uh, it's very well vast. He's had a lot of experiences working and doing research in this area. He would discuss the paper by um, the first paper by Halima over five minutes so that we can move on with this presentation. So the, go on, please.
Thank you. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to this session and a good day. Good day, everybody. L let me first of all start by congratulating the <clears throat> the authors of the of this of this well thought of, well conceived paper. And I want to say first of all that <clears throat> despite all this scourge that COVID has brought, it has certainly brought us some blessings as well. How to live together and how to coordinate and how to work together. I, I, dare I start off with controversy here that um, train them as well as you may, unless you've got meritocracy on the top of things, things will may not work. Um, if you put uh, square pegs in round holes at the top of decision making process, the, the, the training that people have received become almost, almost, almost irrelevant. Um, post the people uh, to the centers that are important, the, 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 the sites that are important, not based on uh, who they know, but what they know and what they may be able to contribute. Now, having said that, I would now turn down to other important areas relevant to, 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 this, to this paper. Uh, and that is, um, I'll start off with the need for leadership and management skills. We need to train people to become leaders we need to train people to become managers. Leaders who can lead themselves, leaders who can lead a team, and leaders who can work with others to, 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 to create an, 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 an impact. The communities that suffer um, most from malaria are usually the rural communities, less privileged, less fortunate. And of course, the research that is being done there, working towards malaria elimination, is led by uh, field workers, community health workers. Whereas the people who really know uh, what to do, don't live the life, to gain the experience, to know what else, how would they to, to think about solutions to the existing problems. Social sciences must be at the forefront. And when I say social science, I'm going to focus more on the need for anthropologists, people who sit and live the life with others to find out exactly what changes are needed in communities to further reduce transmission, particularly in low transmission areas. Um, <clears throat> We must also try to, to, to centralize and coordinate malaria research, um, something that uh, we bring in really skilled people, well-trained people to sit together and do things. I love the idea about integrated training, and I want to extend this further to cross-border training, because most of our communities live close to, next to each other. And if one, one, one country is doing training in one way and the other is doing training in another way, we may soon have a uh, misunderstanding between those two people who are uh, uh, facing the, the, the problems of, uh, of, of malaria research. Again, I want to stress that we must have a well-defined career development pathway. If people are trained and they hit roadblock, no progress, nothing else to do, they'll drop the job and go and look for something else. The same thing applies to our community health workers who lead the, the fight uh, uh, against uh, malaria in, 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 more, less, in more deprived areas than others. Again, we need a well-defined pathway for them, a well-training program, a well-defined um, growth, and also a, 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 a health remuneration for, 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 for the work to do. We must budget well to cover the needs and we must not depend on external donors because external donors, if you depend on them fully, they may drive the agenda and this therefore may not be exactly what the individual country or particular con 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 country needs. Training should not be limited, I agree, to only high flying scientists but to the, uh, also to the people who face the, 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 the problems face on with the, with the communities. I, I want also to just go back to the very beginning of what is relevant here is the, the way the data was collected, not just literature review, but also the fact that information was gathered from frontline workers. I think this is something novel. I think this is very, very important and I'm sure it will offer us some more knowledge than we've ever had. 
I'm sorry, I'm having a, a bad a bad throat this this afternoon. Uh, one minute uh, more, please. One, uh, and and uh, oh, good. <clears throat> I, I've done the so. <coughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 the, 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 the of integrated training, I would have liked to see on the top of the paper rather the bottom, because reading it, I was really worried that we're going to do individual training for malaria and not for the other diseases. We must remember that health service systems is what should reign supreme and all training should be geared towards getting uh, uh, training for. Imani, your question, your time is up, please. Your time is up, please. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Dr. Kora, man. Dr. Kora. Uh, the second discussant uh, of the second paper by Corina will be discussed by Dr. Laura Dari. Dr. Larry Dari is the president of Chessrad Global and uh, International based in London and in Nigeria and is a graduate of the College of Medicine at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and the Takemi Fellow International Head. Laura Gary, please go ahead and speak for just five minutes, please. Thank you very much. It's the uh, first time here, so join others in congratulating everyone on such a <clears throat> robust and very, very timely de the development of different papers. It's been very exciting and the knowledge generation to listen to all the papers. I would like to address the issue of equity from probably four perspectives. The most important thing is to listen to Jesse Bob and know that all our issues of equity all derive from the way our health systems are structured around colonial systems, colonial service delivery, and still retains that today. The colonial system is really the political economy and the governance issues drives inequity at national level, and it also impacts on the inequity that we see at global levels. So it's very refreshing to listen to some of the recommendations on governance and hone in and look at also how governance, the governance and the colonial legacy also impacts on the way we are training the health workforce, impacts on the way we are delivering services, and impacts on the way we are positioning the, man the management styles within malaria control. The paper we looked at, I, I was asked to look at, also looks at equity in terms of universal health coverage. A very interesting term that's part of the SDG, SDG goals. When we consider universal health coverage, of course, the first issue we think about is universal access to inputs. And again, we are looking at inputs to commodities and not input just to services. So if for malaria, we looked at inputs to ACT, access to long treatment methods, but not how the system is structured to deliver the services from community from home base to tertiary care. Malaria is one of the diseases that very well help us to show the capacity of our health systems because you have home-based malaria, first-tier malaria, second-tier malaria, and third-tier malaria, all of which require a functional healthcare system to deliver the, the malaria services and reduce morbidity. However, UHC sometimes tends to focus only on the equity of finances, not equity of access, not the robustness of the healthcare system. And I think these issues also need to be brought to bear as we look at equity and, and, uh, and the service delivery in malaria and UHC. Perhaps what struck me most was the question of social justice and gender equity in the delivery of services for malaria. Thank you really, thank you for bringing up the issues of social justice. If you look at the health workforce for malaria and the burden of care, the burden of impact of malaria, it's on women and children. Yet we do not have enough of a gender targeting of services for malaria within any service, maybe whether it's community or, or, or the tertiary level. The gender inequity also in the burden of care for malaria does not reflect itself in training. It does not reflect itself in gender in, in research capacity and that gender equity needs to be brought to play. COVID has also taught us not just gender equity, but that for things like malaria, social justice and integrated care remains an issue. I agree with KLHG very much and many of the other speakers that malaria should be made an economic, an economic emergency. We in Africa must not lose the opportunity to relate and take COVID, the investment in COVID, not just to COVID, but to malaria and to social justice systems and an integrated system. 
like COVID, malaria affects all sectors, even if it's just absenteeism at work and the burden to economies of being absent at work, the burdens to economies of, 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 um, of wrong, inappropriate treatment for malaria, the burdens to, to the communities, it, it, it should be declared an economic burden. Lastly, we have had again and again the word community. Yet we do not define the community that we're referring to. Sometimes we, may, we, we say community and we are talking about only the first contact to care. It's the same person that accesses primary level care, secondary level care, and tertiary level care for malaria. I've had personal experience where malaria, malaria rapidly evolved from simple malaria to severe malaria within a space of 24 hours, requiring all the system to work from preventive to simple curative to, to, to oxygen tents for malaria and to treatment in an ICU. That time is so short, yet, we think that malaria is just something that we treat in the clinics. And it's reflected mainly in the kind of workforce we present for malaria. Nurses, doctors, but there, is, and there are environmental health scientists. There are, there's vector control. There's community-based engagement. There's educating grandmothers. There, there's so much that we need to do within that definition of community without thinking it's just a, separate, a primary level care, but it's community that says, if my daughter has malaria or if my daughter is living somewhere, from the preventive care to the last, last mile care, which is, and last mile, I mean tertiary care where she may need an oxygen tent, it should be available within the system. Community is not a location, community is an individual. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawa, sorry for that wonderful points of the discussion. Um, I think we have just about 30 minutes left for this session. And it's time for us to talk Take some questions. There are a couple of questions for both Halima and Corina. And I will start with uh, the questions uh, directed at Halima, which is uh, a question which I know has featured repeatedly in this platform. How do you engage the private sector in uh, capacity building and training for malaria? That's a question for Halima. Halima, over to you, please. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor. We, we, in the paper, we do discuss the, the, the importance of bringing in all the different sectors um, for training and to engage the private sector in, uh, in training. It is important that we look at what we talked about earlier with regard to having a curricula that is going to be run across all institutions, whether they are private sector or they are uh, public sector. And, and, and this will be in institutions, whether they are universities, whether they are training colleges. So using that one curricula or strategy for training would be very important. The other thing is that um, with the private sector engagement in areas of um, um, services and delivery for, for malaria. Most private sector uh, facilities see a lot of malaria. And the, 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 the big issue has been that national malaria control programs have a big problem in interacting with the, with, the, with the private sector. Although it is changing now with many of our countries starting to have um, focused uh, private sector engagement strategies. And I know that Nigeria is one of the countries that has won and several other countries have that. And that is the beginning of really ensuring that the private sector is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And, and, and it's, it's following and working in, in the same steps as the private, uh, as the public sector. Over. Thank you, Halima. For well, Corinna, I have two questions for you. One is for me personally, and that's the first question which is that you talked extensively about inequity. Uh, and, and at the beginning of this session, Halima also talked about uh, the fact that women are the major healthcare workers on malaria, but they have the least resources, the least preeminence, and they are a little bit under-resourced as compared to men. So when you spoke, I'd like you to address women as uh, a group that has been underrepresented in terms of uh, malaria, in fact, research and training and capacity building. How do you address that going forward? That's the first question for you, Corina. 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Something we definitely talked a lot about um, when we were having these discussions about equity um, and something that's touched on in the paper. You know, I think a, a, a few responses. So one um, is, again, getting to, you know, this idea of sort of intersectionality and, and potentially not thinking of just women and children as this kind of monolithic block, but thinking about what groups within that may need additional attention, different strategies, and really thinking about how vulnerability intersects in important ways. Um, and the second um, is really, you know, as you mentioned, as came up in the presentation before mine and in the discussion, being really cognizant of the massive and disproportionate burden that malaria plays for women, both at the household level, at the professional level, in terms of the healthcare workforce, within the scientific community, and, and seeing that as an inequity and calling it an inequity and really calling the burden of malaria inequitable and using that sort of language and that kind of framing, not just a universal thing that like everyone could get, but really focusing on the fact that the malaria burden and our response to malaria sort of is entwined with inequities and, and paying more attention to that is necessary. Um, and so certainly thinking about what that means for capacity building, for workforce development. I thought the points about, you know, over-reliance on um, a mostly female, sometimes underpaid, undervalued health workforce was really important. Um, you know, we were much more focused on the service delivery side, but certainly these issues cross-cut back, you know, to who's providing the services, who trains them, who else is in the, who else is sort of at the table and in the room when decisions are being made. Thank you, Corina, for that uh, brilliant answer. Uh, the second question from the audience, and uh, the question is, how can institutions actually invest more in the social sciences and behavior change research, uh, which I know is currently going on in several universities, but how can they do more? And that's the question from the audience. I love that question. Um, I mean, I think the responsibility for that falls on, on many of us. Um, and I highlighted, for example, the role of funders. So not to call out the National Institutes of Health or the Gates Foundation, but you know the large funders who put a lot of money into malaria research, I hope that they kind of increasingly put dollars behind the people part of the equation as came up in the presentation before mine. So there's been a lot of focus on the mosquitoes and a lot of focus on commodities and, and those sorts of questions and, and much less about the, the people and the sort of way that malaria manifests and better understanding that and the nuance of that. So I think, you know, thinking about funding for research, you know, financing for research, um, I think at universities, certainly training the next generation of scholars, um, you know, I go to a number of global health conferences and I see lots of people working on like social determinants of HIV risk and almost no one working really on social determinants of malaria risk. It's a much smaller community working on that. So really bringing new voices in, new scholars in, encouraging new research on this. Um, you know, I think maybe as came up in earlier presentation, there's been so much focus on sort of commodities and this comes up in our paper also, you know, seeing malaria as essentially a commodity driven question. How do we get products to people? But that's not the whole question. So expanding the way we think about malaria control and what research is needed, I think is really important. Thank you very much, Corina. We still have about five minutes. So I would like to go around the presenters uh, for just one with reflections on what they are going to take away and advice to the participants and audience. Just, I will begin by just telling us what you think the capacity building for malaria control and elimination in Africa should look like, what particular areas would you like us to emphasize? So I would like you, the five, uh, four participants, Halima, start with you with the one minute or less than one minute thoughts about that. Um, thank you, Prof. What, what I would say is that um, right now we have a critical mass of uh, biomedical scientists in Africa. And this has taken, a this has happened because because of a deliberate effort to make that happen. And I think that we can do the same for the social sciences, all, you know, across the board to ensure that there is a focus on that so that all the issues we are talking about, the leadership, the community engagement, and all those areas are really having um, a key critical mass of, of experts and, and, and people who can work in that particular area. It can happen and it, it, it should happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Halima. Corina, please. 
Give us your thoughts on what you think we should take away from this session. Yeah, I mean, I think I use this expression of, you know, malaria being a big tent community. And I think it, it's seeing kind of equity questions as, as part of the agenda and part of that big tent. Um, also being really cognizant and uh, responsive to some of the issues that were brought up about the ways in which colonial legacies shape risk entirely influence sort of where we're where we're starting, where we want to go with equity um, issues as we're brought up about movements and thinking about, you know, greater social forces that are afoot. Malaria does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a multitude of different arenas. And so really seeing those as intersecting and, and being attentive to the ways in which those crossings of disciplines need to be researched and understood in order to develop a robust response. Thank you, Corina. Kumani, I, I, I see you were not feeling too well at the last session. I, Will you be able to give us your thoughts on this? It would be very useful. Because I know the Gambia, you've done a lot of work in the Gambia and malaria. And we're happy to know what the advice is. I'll try to, to, to make a comment. I'll, I'll, okay. Thank you. I, I, would, I would like to see more training devoted to leadership and management. Getting a PhD in any of the biomedical sciences or in any other subject does not make you a leader. And unless you can lead, and in particular be able to lead so that people can follow and be proud of you and want to do what you do, you, the, the, nothing would move forward. So let's spend some more efforts on training of uh, our leaders and also training them to manage well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as a leader of Chess Raj, uh, the champion of uh, health and training in Africa, can you please give us your thoughts on this final thoughts, please? Well, I think that we should continue to seek to put social justice at the center of our training, not just clinical care. Social justice, gender equity needs to be at the center of training and community should be recognized to be not a location, but an individual who needs help. Thank you. Thank you, Lola Dari. Thank you to Mani. Thank you, Corina. Thank you, Halima. Thank you for the participants. All of you who have listened carefully. Uh, it's a great session, and I hope we we'll go out with the reflections that we've had in this session. So it's now my honor and privilege to introduce the next session, Professor Emeritus Professor Brooks Leke, a champion in this field in African continent. Professor Leke, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Okonofua, for that introduction. And thanks to all the speakers. This has been so enriching so far. And now we'll take on this session, which I'm co-chairing with the Global Malaria Program Director, my brother and friend, Dr. Pedro Alonso. Pedro, are you on? I, I am on, my dear friend, okay. sister, and uh, leader. I was having difficulty in getting unmuted and uh, have my camera on, but here I am, I'm listening, and I'm as, as always following you, my dear. I know, thank you, because we need you here. You're in this, what questions, what we want to know from these people. We have three excellent panelists this morning. We have a dean of a faculty. We're here talking about what is the role of universities in partnership for malaria elimination. So we have a dean, Rhoda Wanyenzi, who is the professor and dean of the School of Public Health in Makerere University. Rhoda is a professor and dean. She has vast experience in infectious diseases research, capacity building and program management, especially in HIV and TB, and has conducted several studies in maternal and child health. And next to her, we have a national malaria control person leader, what we call a permanent secretary, where she comes from, Dr. Dorothy Fosa Achu, permanent secretary for the National Malaria Control Program, Minister of Public Health in Cameroon, where I come from. Dorothy is the permanent secretary, has played a significant role in the development, implementation, and evaluation of malaria policy in Cameroon. She's a physician and has conducted research on malaria control, hold an advanced master's degree in public health methods and diploma in malaria studies. And then we have here 
Professor Dowdan Diaye, Chief of Department of Parasitology and Mycology at Sheikh Anta Diop University in Second, Senegal. And with Professor, Professor Ndiaye, he's head of parasitology labs at Le Dantec Research and Training Hospital in Dakar. So he has university, he has research institute, and then come to it again, he is the head manages managing field site activities in Senegal for a number of collaborating institutions, including Harvard University, Tulane University, the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and also director of the International Research and Training Center. So we have all this. Just to say that he can then give us what it is to be working in the university and the malaria control program. He has that experience. We have a malaria control program person and we have a dean. So to start with, I would just like to know from you all, very important to know how are universities working in partnership with the national malaria control programs? You know, how they're doing it, what can be improved? And I really would like to start that discussion with uh, Rhoda Wanyenzi, to see how she's doing that. And then we move on to Professor Ndiaye and then to Dorothy and let's see it. Rhoda, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening everyone. And uh, to start with, I need to appreciate uh, the organizers for this um, excellent innovation and uh, getting us to rethink uh, malaria. I would like to also appreciate the opportunity to contribute uh, towards uh, the discussion on the role of universities. So um, I think that we have a lot of opportunity as universities, we shape the thinking, we shape actions, we shape the culture in our communities. And this uh, goes without saying um, that we do have a critical role uh, in malaria as well. And we have um, done quite a lot um, in our experience uh, using uh, the example of the School of Public Health um, at Makere University in terms of uh, uh, co-production and utilization of knowledge. And I'll share some examples of this. Uh, but also touching on issues around uh, translation of evidence and implementation science in terms of what we have done and the gaps uh, therein, and uh, also looking at uh, monitoring and evaluation of interventions to inform uh, the scale up as well as capacity building. To begin with, I'll not go so much into examples of specific research projects in particular. We've had a lot uh, about uh, uh, the, the issues around research and especially focusing this on areas that might not necessarily be priorities at the local level and especially more on issues around dissemination and publications that might not necessarily have a lot of impact. But I would like to say that we have turned this around uh, in the recent years and I'll share a few examples but I'll start with especially our focus on partnerships uh, in leadership and management capacity building as well as uh, continuous quality improvement uh, of programs sharing a few examples. The first example I'd like to share with you is uh, a program that we designed in leadership and management uh, integrating continuous quality improvement and we merged these aspects out of a needs assessment that we did across districts in Uganda. Then we engaged with the Ministry of Health uh, all through the process, not just for designing the questions that we used in the needs assessment, but we also worked with, the, uh, with them to uh, discuss what was emerging and also involved the district leadership in these discussions uh, in terms of designing the competencies that we wanted to focus on as well as the approaches in the training. So we decided after this engagement that we are going to to do not just the usual didactic uh, training, but we are going to do uh, a hands-on program where we can integrate problem identification as well as solving and as well as uh, a measurement of the baseline and after implementation to see the changes that 
uh, these interventions create. So this program we implemented uh, initially started with HIV, but we eventually expanded it to TB and uh, malaria with support from the Global Fund. Um, then I will also mention uh, analysis that we did uh, again after engagement and identifying challenges, especially in terms of uh, tracking uh, the impact of investments and using routinely collected service data uh, to assess the uh, mobility as well as mortality, uh, all cause and HIV and TB and malaria. And we did this work uh, for a period of covering 15 years. Um, we faced a lot of challenges, I must say, especially in terms of the quality of the data. We came face to face with all the issues, including having to dig up paper-based records, some of which were destroyed in containers and a lot of issues. But the beauty with what we did is uh, not only were we able to construct a story to show the changes uh, in uh, these critical indicators based on the investments, we were also able to highlight a lot of challenges in routine service data and how it's managed as well as uh, mortality data in the country. And there have since been uh, a number of partners that have started working around some of the challenges that we identified. Then I will also mention a, a, a program that we are implementing jointly with the Ministry of Health, uh, which we call monitoring and evaluation and uh, uh, technical assistance which focuses on improving data quality and reporting, as well as uh, health information uh, systems and uh, data use in decision-making. This program, again, started with HIV, but has now in integrated uh, a wider scope, moving on to uh, uh, disease preparedness and response, and uh, certainly has a lot of opportunities for us to broaden it to also include uh, malaria along the way. So that's an opportunity. But in the interim, we've expanded this program to also address the broader capacity building and health system strengthening, especially at the district level. And then I'll also uh, highlight a program we have been working on, Partnerships Beyond Uganda, where we, have, we are working with, initially it was eight universities in Eastern and uh, Southern uh, Africa. We call it a partnership to enhance technical support for analytical capacity uh, and data use in malaria, HIV, and TB. It's funded by the Global Fund. And uh, we started with eight universities up to the end of uh, December 2020, using routinely collected data to analyze and inform actions uh, of the ministries of health and using priorities that are set by the ministries of health in terms of the questions that they wanted us to answer. This is not necessarily the usual primary data collection and research project. It's working with the ministries of health using the data they have, using the priorities that they set, and also working alongside the relevant people uh, related to M&E &E and data analysis within the ministries of health. So it's not about carrying away the data and analyzing it in the university, it's working alongside them to analyze the data, to interpret it and explore opportunities where they can use these findings to uh, make decisions. The other approach that we use in this network is the local university in each uh, country leads the engagement with the ministries of health and also the analysis of the data. We don't have people moving from one country to another and moving expertise to a country that is presumed not to have sufficient expertise. We learn from one another and we let the, the local university lead. And then I'll also mention another initiative that we're currently uh -huh. starting, um, uh, which we are calling the African Leadership and Management Training for Impact on malaria eradication. Again, we are using the same model of universities partnering with ministries of health and local universities leading the engagement and work with the ministry, focusing on leadership and management and use of evidence uh, in malaria eradication efforts. So I'll stop at that yes, and uh, happy to share um, some, uh, some of the gaps later on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, very enriching. We'll move over now to Professor Ndiaye. Can you just briefly also give us an idea of what you're doing in partnerships? As uh, Professor Ndiaye, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Lake. Um, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, say hello to Professor Diverse. 
and also to my friend, Professor Pedro, uh, <laughs> Global Manager, GMP Director, and all who are attending to the meeting. Um, I'm trying to focus on what has been done in my country in terms of collaboration partnership with the NMCP here. And, uh, uh, and I, I think Professor Tumani Kora just mentioned the need to have, for instance, local funding system. And I can tell, for instance, that one of the biggest partners here uh, to, to our work locally is the NMCP because everyone knows that PMI is supporting a lot of work in Africa. And PMI is supporting NMCP based on this is for, for this science evidence. And we have also for technical aspect and training system where NMCP become a very, very good partner. And, and from what we learn from this partnership, to be honest, it's a win-win partnership uh, of collaboration. Why? Because for, let's say for from science, what we need to do for science, what, what we are looking for. We're looking for, I mean, it's, uh, evidence, scientific evidence for what we're doing. And for that, we need sites. And so all the sites, for instance, in Senegal are under the control of NMCP for Sentinel site. If, if you want to do some activities there, you need to have NMCP approval for that, through the, and then the Ministry of Health for IAB. You need to have patience, for instance. You want to test, like some tests for, I mean, SMC, I mean, I mean, impact in the community. To get those patients, I mean, the population, definitely you have to work with the NMCP Ministry of Health to get access to the data, to get also access to the community leader, for instance, all the authority who are leading this activity, and then to the MD who are authorizing any activities that are going to be implemented. You also to need to have, I mean, data, I mean, sometimes to interpret, to analyze some, some activities. We're working with IDM through a Gates Foundation and Harvard program, and IDM funds need some other additional data, not from, from our collection activities, but that data collected from the NMCP. In order to get those data, you need to have collaboration with that. And, and what is the EP data? Um, definitely, we are testing something, for instance. We want to know if the RDT is working correctly in Senegal, if there, there is no HRP deletion. For that, we need to get access for the patients for, at, at the point of care. So at this point, it becomes a win-win partnership for us. NMCP need to know if really the RDT they're using in Senegal is work, working yes or no because of the issue of HRP2 deletion. They need scientists to, to understand the question, to, 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 to pose the question, and then to, to have the response. From us also, we need to show that these are a, a, a project of interest. We need to get those samples. And this a kind of, a, 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 I mean, I mean win-win partnership. Uh, we need, for instance, to get access to to, NMC, uh, uh, to the MD, for instance. Today, NMCP were working a lot for um, understanding what the, I mean, some impacts of intervention for instance, in the South, where for many years sometimes, uh, I mean, partners were putting money there, NMCP was going, implementing activities. Sometimes there is, a, a, I mean, a doubt of if really those activities are working, yes or no. They use all the indicator they have, and then they try, they say, let's look for any, any other intervention or indicator. And for that, for instance, they learn from our collaboration uh, that there is genomic, I mean, I mean, program that has, might help to understand that. They come to us and we help them also to go and understand what's happening. Uh, it's not only for, for, for AP, for instance, it's not for RDT. Let's say ICT, for instance. NMCP is trying to implement and then to use ACTs that is now for sure working, but we well, we have no for sure there is a lot of is some issue in Asia and even some now in, in some East African in for some 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 mutation in the case setting. They want to know if the NMC the ICT we are using in Senegal is working yes or no. If they they, they, they need to uh, to do some science and for science they have to work with the university because our primary job is science and then we help with them or work with them to understand. And, and at this point, I can say that's why I think from what I say to now, it becomes a very important aspect to have this strong collaboration. Not collaboration, but to build a team. A team where, I mean, everyone have a have, have, have reward. For instance, science will say something, but NMCP has also something to say. It becomes a team where before we do for publication, uh, go for publication, any data generated are support, I mean, share with NMCP uh, and to have their feedback to have their input before we go to the national validation and sharing the information before the publication. This needs to be a, a rule everywhere in order to have it win-win. And this also not only for only a country, but open can open activities. I mentioned RDT, I mentioned ACTs, I can mention other I mean activities for instance. There is a PECADEM system implemented in Senegal. 
what is the pecadem is home based management nncp is sending people train people uh, to the community to train uh, to test and then to do the first i mean case management cpo for that they need training who is doing providing yeah. the training university are providing for providing training and before yeah. we train all the community we need to go train an mcp leader we need to go to train the older leader because first of all they need to understand what we that they doing and if they not do not know what they doing they not going to implement correctly they need monitoring evaluation everyone know that for monitoring evaluation we need science evidence and all the information and lastly what i'm going to focus is the, the the capacity building for instance uh mcp is implement in training i mean uh, health worker in the field for instance we are implementing genomics aspects in in the field i need to know, to 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 to, uh, to learn to train uh, mds to understand genomic approach not techniques in order to do, go to get those um, to access to the md i go to a training organized by nmcp where they open a floor for me ask, give us access to the NM, md and have a discussion with them and in one day we can spend all the information i have for genomics to the whole community of md in, in charge of tra treatment okay and back, back to back we can we can come back and 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 make it so finally you have to build a team between nncp and the university in order to have successful program thank you very much that sounds like the ideal situation what's really happening there now let's hear from dr dorothy achu and uh, national malaria control program cameroon dr achu you have the floor thank you very much Cheers and uh, good evening, good morning to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. So, um, Professor Rhoda and Professor Njai have really gone into the details and examples on how NMCPs are working with universities. Um, I'm just going to emphasize that uh, MCPs really need the support of universities to uh, generate evidence that help in decision making, but also to continuously improve the quality of our interventions. And they have both mentioned about capacity building and research. So I will just mention that in our case and in our experience, the NMCP is supported by universities, but also other training and research institutions, uh, faculties of medicine, faculties of science, national and international research institutes, uh, which are also affiliated to universities, both at home and abroad. And they have key roles, um, which they, they support the NMCP in. First is, as you've heard, training, training or capacity building. And we, we could, uh, summarize that into initial training because our universities are the ones that produce the health workforce. They train both medical, paramedical, social scientists, public health specialists, and, 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 and that, that is even the initial training and provide that workforce that we need in program implementation. But they also support the program and the Ministry of Health to continuously refresh uh, the, the, the capacity of, of, of the health workers in terms of in-service training. The in-service training, which may not be satisfactorily done all the time, but uh, because they are always updating of guidelines and they are always new skills and new ways of doing things, uh, there is always a need to refresh the capacity of, of the health workforce. And uh, recently we've even used universities to help in supervising this health workforce in service, on-site supervisions, but also in mentoring, mentoring in case of, uh, of research, mentoring in case of case management, especially when it comes to severe mal malaria case management. So that is all about capacity building. But I also like to mention one of the areas which is operational research. Operational research um, that has accompanied the program and, and, and uh, Professor Jaya has really gone into the detail on how uh, research is being done to support the program in the various uh, interventions that they carry out. Um, here, we want to just highlight the fact that we are still doing a lot of routine way of doing things 
and uh, we, we, we haven't uh, switched to a problem solving, is a problem solving um, method of, of generating our research uh, questions. And um, I'm very happy that Professor Roda spoke to that because it is very important that we sit and do a real needs assessment and see what are the re priority problems that we want to solve before we get into research. Most of our research is uh, very repetitive, very routine, checking the efficacy of tools that we already know are effective and not really going into finding out how we can use those tools to improve the effectiveness of our interventions. And there are very various ways of designing research that, that could help us solve these problems and increase uh, our, our, our coverage. For example, the, 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 the use of LLINs, the coverage is still not optimal. IPT is still 31% for example, in the in general uh, population, we should be asking what will it take us to move from 31% to 80% and what are the bottlenecks? And, and if there are hypotheses on what is blocking, do we have any research evidence and, and solutions to bring in? Uh, because this uh, issue of really bringing solutions to our, our, our programs is going to help make them more effective and then we also have, um, the way we work with the universities is such so that we, we, we help revise the teaching curricula because they also have a lot of schools have very uh, outdated um, a curricula that they use uh, not only uh, the vector controls, but also the treatment guidelines that need to be updated all the time. So we work with the universities to, to align these guidelines so that when the, 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 the medical or the paramedical staff is leaving school, they are well equipped to manage. And uh, there is still much to be done in this aspect because uh, we mentioned about a holistic approach to malaria control, and this is not yet the case. When they go out there, they, are, they go out to treat cases. They don't go out to see the problem as, as a, a multidisciplinary problem and, and, and having skills uh, like communication and managerial skills to hand, harness uh, all the efforts and even data management. All of these, they usually do not have the skills when they leave school. So we are looking at this area not only modifying the curricula in terms of the content uh, of, of the control means, but also in terms of, of, of the pedagogic approach, helping them to know how to approach the problem, but also how to do research, eventually how to identify the problems and how to uh, formulate key research uh, questions to, to, to address these problems. And then we would like to also mention uh, technical assistance, which uh, the universities are providing very much uh, in, in developing policies and in, in designing our programs and even evaluating the program's performance. It's important that the skilled expertise we have at the universities, they come with us doing program evaluations, they sit with us and, and, and look at our data and, and, and we, we work within scientific committees, which the program has in various domains, vector control, there are university professors involved, diagnostics and, and all in terms of diagnosis, there are university uh, professors involved. And uh, we all look at the data, we look at the problems, and then we, we, we suggest solutions to all of them. Of course, there's still much to be done, but that is where we are and where we, go, we hope to go to. Thank you. Thank very you much. very much, very enriching. Now I'll hand over to Pedro, you're there. I am here, and uh, yes. as I said at the very opening of, of, uh, of this <coughs> Rethinking Malaria session, um, I'm here to, to listen, to listen, and to learn, to learn. And uh, what a privilege it is to hear these uh, panelists. Um, uh, dear Rhoda, uh, my very dear uh, Dorothy, and my very dear uh, friend uh, Dauda. You know, as they were speaking, I say, well, this is really good. And, and I've enjoyed the concept that Dauda was alluding to of making a team. Historically, and this is not just about malaria and, and malaria in Africa. I mean, everywhere, the university has a certain difficulty 
in in the interactions with the say public health agencies or or implementers it's never an easy relation that's true in the us it's true in europe it's true everywhere and the examples i've heard today are positive ones um, be this from Makerere or from Dakar or from uh, Yaoundé uh, and from different perspectives, from the university professors or from, or from the implementers, as, as the case of, of, of Dorothy. And um, I think we may be seeing examples of uh, bridging um, the space between academia and, um, and the public health policy makers and implementers, which, as I say, in other areas, we do find difficulties. So the concept of team that Dauda spoke, so important. Um, the university, we all come from a university. We've all been through a university. And, um, and the role in training and in research uh, is clear. Um, uh, making the link with the, the implementers is the challenge, but we're, we've heard some good examples. But the one thing that universities speak to their soul, to their raison d'etre, uh, is something which is very dear to me and which Dorothy has spoken to. It's the place where you question, uh, where you have the freedom to challenge, um, the safe space where um, we can have ideas floated around um, and, uh, and uh, uh, lively discussions take place. That's the role of academia. And that is why uh, in the very early days, we were very happy to see Harvard, a, a safe academic space where uh, everything can be challenged, everything can be questioned to take on this rethinking malaria. And Dorothy said, it, it, is, it is in that space that we need to adopt the problem-solving approach, or it can help us address the problem-solving approach. And probably the biggest cha change that could happen in malaria control in, in Africa is if NMCPs, ministries of health, but with the support of universities, adopt a problem-solving approach. We rethink what are the challenges in our own specific countries. What are the problems? How can we address this problem and improve the coverage of LLINs that uh, Dorothy was saying, or how can we go from the 30% IPTP current coverage to 80%, uh, avoid the missed opportunities. Uh, that is the problem solving mindset. That is what universities have to be active partners in, um, in, a, in a close collaboration with NMCPs and, and ministries of health, forming a team but bringing in that culture of challenging, problem solving, and, uh, and uh, trying to find ways, ways forward. So, uh, Rose, I, I find this in incredibly, incredibly exciting. Thank you very, very much, Pedro, for you know, those comments. And I think it's important what he said about the team and what you've just said, like Dorothy talked about, uh, problem solving and so, but there, there's this idea that I want to bring in here is more, you know, there's what about data, quality data, it always bothers me, you know, to see data, we've talked data, data, data. So I see in Senegal and DI is working with that and I'm sure you are helping with the NMCP with the data to make it quality data, to bring it in, to help them train and so on. Can you comment a little bit on that part of how can we get good quality data? Uh, Professor Ndiaye and maybe yeah. Rode will say something. And uh, that's, you, we've yeah. talked a lot about data is something we can't move. I saw it in polio. It's great to have, you know, the way it worked in polio, but it's not the same in, at all. And if we got to that, with malaria will be far away. So tell us, that, Prof. That, that, I am listening to you. That's a very important point you mentioned here because yeah. what I mentioned earlier in my I mean, I mean, comments, uh, the fact that the uh, I mean, will receive a lot of money. For, I mean, money, I was not a lot of money for some side to implement. And then there are some doubt of the data generated. It what you say here, because people were saying maybe the data were not good collected. Meaning, I mean, and uh, uh, why data collection and data generation is very important. 
And, and this was the most, most important thing to validate. Our job was, first of all, to validate data that had been collected from the NNCP. And then using another system of analysis from the genomics and from also. And we also were able, of, and, and my colleague was just mentioning supervision. Anything is done now is done by the NNCP, as you mentioned, Professor Lake. We make sure that uh, implementation system is good. We make sure that the data collection sheet, for instance, if it can be tablet or hard copy, are very well designed and having all information, useful information. Because sometimes you collect data, very well, collection was very good, but data was not useful. Our mm -hmm. job is for them to say, okay, let's use this data because from the science perspective, as Pedro mentioned, we want to understand things. And there are a lot of information we're looking for. If you don't include, for instance, for, I mean, travel history, for example, in the North, where Senegal is, uh, I mean, trying for elimination, for elimination, if there is no travel information, and what kind of travel information is looked, and how was linked to the travel information to the system? Because if you just take a date patient's information somewhere and just put it we, without having any link between this patient's household and the system, the data collection will not be useful because the, the patient itself will not give information. We need to have the whole system. That's why I say the quality control is something that the, the human university is helping the system to make sure that data collected are good enough data collected are the ones we are looking for, and then data collected are in phase with what science were, were, were doing. Generally, is is Really is, like that. Thank you very much, very much. Rhoda? And thank you, Rose. Um, so I Briefly. give an example of uh, one of the projects we are doing right now, funded by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, initially started with uh, HIV, but we are addressing exactly uh, some of the, the issues that my colleague was talking about. Um, the system for collecting data right from the tools, um, the appropriateness, and then looking at the system for entering and managing the data, including cleaning um, uh, with the district and facility levels to ensure that we have uh, uh, clean uh, data, and, uh, and then moving that a step further to um, analyzing and using the data uh, for- Are you gonna get that into very... malaria also? We do hope it's that we will be working right now. very it's, well, um, HIV. Now we want to get this working with malaria. Are you it's telling us that to will happen? health security, and I hope it will to malaria as well, because we are okay. working within the national system at the BHIS too. Yeah. Okay. And Dorothy, what yes. anything briefly on that? Yes, Tom. I think. Well, we'll say we are really, we've done an assessment on the data quality system. And uh, it's very important to identify exactly where the problems are. So data collection uh, at every point is, is important as she mentioned. Uh, but I think we are moving towards the digitalization because um, when, we, when we train our, our, our health force, a health workforce. The idea is also sometimes the promptness in the data and how well this data is used in a timely manner. And once it's still data ba uh, pa uh, paper based, it comes up very slowly and sometimes decisions cannot follow in a very timely manner. So there are several issues that we need to handle concerning okay. data. All right. We know, you know, we've heard what the others said. The teamwork is important. We don't have more time, but I just want, you know me, it's the game, game changing strategy. <laughs> want to hear. Prof. Sundiaye, what is it? The, the game strategy is, as I yeah. mentioned, is making a team. And I, you, everyone mentioned and uh, put it, we have to build a team. Everything okay. that has to consider the NMCP yeah. and our scientist team. And if there is any meeting, for instance, organized by NMCP, if it's not a science, it's just for sharing information. We have to be part of that. I think if Absolutely. we do it, we do it. I agree very well with you, Rhoda. Um, uh, to me, it would be the leadership and quality improvement, continuously learning and driven by evidence. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Yes, again, I will just say it's important to ask the right questions and look for the right answers so that we move on. From where we are thank you okay pedro you have the last word well no I, I thought you were also going to ask me i would i was going to say well as we do in university and you do multiple tests one of the options is all of the above 
So <laughs> that's the one I would take. All of what my colleagues have already said. Um, uh, but uh, given that you, 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 you've talked about data and quality, getting data is important. The quality is essential. And of course, the other thing is using the data. And I think that that's another space where the, the team, as Dauda says, can play a critical role. Um, there is capacity, there is knowledge, there are incredibly well-trained and talented um, uh, professionals in Africa, so that the data that is generated is primarily analyzed and used yes. in, in the countries themselves. You don't need to send the, the data anywhere else. You can actually do it yourself. And again, that's a critical role which doesn't speak to the biomedical space. It, bring, it speaks to the, the amazing cadre of young IT analysts, data pe people that are being trained uh, in universities in, in, in Africa. So let us not restrict ourselves to, to the biomedical space, to the malaria mm -hmm. specialists or the health specialists. We have to draw on the demographers. We have to draw on, yeah. the, on the IT folks, on the data people, on the geographers. Uh, uh, and so on. And um, but um, I, I say once again, all of the above. Thank you so much. All of the above. Thank you very much, panelists. You're great, Pedro. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you, Professor Ndiaye and uh, Dorothy. My gratitude. We'll con we continue the discussion. It's you know just what, beginning. Uh, Rose, it's going on. Yes. Uh, thank Rose, you. With people thank like you. this, with people like this, malaria will be eliminated. Absolutely. Now you believe it. Okay, Pedro. Great. Okay. Thanks so much to you all. Now I'll hand over the session to uh, Dr. Speciosa and